All right, folks, thank you very much for joining us here today to talk about what the state is doing to slow the spread of coronavirus here in Nebraska. Again, we're starting at a different time, 1215, because we've got a pardons board meeting uh, this afternoon. So, and we're also going to make this an abbreviated briefing because I've got to get out to that pardons board meeting. So we're going to go from 1215 to roughly 1245. So we're going to try and move this along, along at a pretty good clip. Uh, but as always, I want to remind people about our six rules to stay home. This is day 18 of 21 to stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. Our rules are stay home, no essential, non-essential trips outside the household. We want people to work, but work from home if you can. And if you're going to the workplace, practice all those good social, physical distancing guidelines we talked about, like six feet distance between people and so forth. Um, avoid group, you know, nobody, no groups above number of 10 people, that sort of thing. Uh, we want to, number three, we want to make sure that people shop alone. So when you go out, go once a week, have a list, be efficient, get in the store, get out of the store. Uh, we, stores are an opportunity to catch the virus, so please, everybody, be efficient when you go to the store. Do not take your entire family to the store. One person goes shopping for everybody. And then, uh, of course, we uh, want to make sure we help kids socially distance by keeping them at home to play, avoiding playgrounds, don't do group sports. Help seniors. Help them stay in by running errands for them or shopping for them so that they can avoid those crowds. And then, of course, number six, we want people to exercise at home or with an appropriately socially distanced type exercise. So, again, remember our, our six rules to keep Nebraska healthy as we're staying home to stay healthy. Also, we want to remind people about testnebraska.com. Testnebraska.com is one of the ways that we are going to be expanding our testing program. So over the last seven days, we've averaged about 1,000 tests a day. When we get this up fully ramped up, it'll be about 3,000 tests a day on top of that 1,000 tests a day. Our first two testing sites will be Omaha and Grand Island. So especially if you're from the Omaha or Grand Island area, great opportunity to be able to go to testnebraska.com, get signed up for the assessment. It takes less than five minutes. Your data, uh, this is a follow-up from a question last week, your data will not be sold either individually or in aggregate. It will be kept absolutely private in an encrypted database, so you can feel confident that when you're signing up, your data is going to be your data. So please go on, get signed up, and also, we now have that assessment in Spanish as well. So the home page is not in Spanish yet. We're working on that part of it. But once you get past the, the home page and go on to the start now, you'll be able to flip from English to Spanish. So uh, go check that out. Again, if you're a Spanish language speaker and prefer to fill out that assessment in Spanish that is now available to you. Just uh, in the upper right-hand corner, there's a box that says English. Just flip that to Espanol. So you'll be able to do that. So again, please sign up, especially if you're in Omaha and Lincoln, or Omaha and Grand Island for the testnebraska.com. We currently have over 89,000 people set up. We need more, folks. We need more people to su sign up, so please go sign up and then challenge five of your friends to sign up through uh, hashtag testnebraskachallenge. Get people signed up. Let's use, you know, Let's make this go viral so we can fight the virus, right? So get people signed up. Uh, later today, or actually we're going to now hear from Tony Goins, who's our Director of Economic Development, and he's going to talk about the task force he's put together the, to be able to um, uh, help reopen our economy, the Get Nebraska Growing Task Force. So, Director Goins, can you come up here and talk a little bit about your uh, task force you got put together here? Yes, sir. I'm honored to, Governor. Thank you. So good afternoon, and uh, thanks to Governor Ricketts for his steady leadership. Uh, the state during these challenging times is very admirable, and I know all of the citizens in this community greatly appreciate it. The state of Nebraska is working closely with business leaders to restore growth in our economy. As we do, I want all Nebraskans to know that we are committed to resuming business operations safely and in keeping with health guidelines. The spirit of togetherness and willingness to cooperate among the state's businesses, banks, ag community, and economic developers has long been the strength of Nebraska. The fruit of these partnerships has been on display during, these pan during this pandemic. Nebraska is ranked near the top of the nation for takeout services from restaurants during the pandemic. Our state has also led the way in the Paycheck Protection Program ranking among the states with the highest number of PPP loan approvals per capita. The strong partnership doesn't happen by chance. 
It takes ongoing communication, a commitment to collaborate, and a dedication to support one another. So today, I am excited to announce the Get Nebraska Growing, uh, Growing Task Force. Yes. And that will lead the way to bolstering cooperation among Nebraska businesses. Now on this task force, I will lead the task force, but I'll be joined by Leslie Anderson from the Bank of Bennington, John McCoy from Orthman Manufacturing, Paul Young's Young's Hospitality, Rob Robertson, Nebraska Farm Bureau, Mike Mapes, the Alliance Group, Deb McCausland, she's the past Custer Economic Development Corporate Executive Director, Carmen Tapio from North End Teleservices. Its purpose will be to identify and communicate best practices that, and guidelines that will help us safely reopen our economic sectors that have been impacted by COVID-19. We've already started to engage advisors in various industries and associations such as the barber, restaurant, and the retail associations. And we're working closely with our chambers of commerce who are intimately acquainted with the concerns of the business community. These advisors will remain engaged throughout the process to provide real-time information to the task force so that we can plan and communicate accordingly. Our business leaders care deeply about their teammates and customers. And together, we will work to come up with guidelines that prioritize safety. At the same time, we want to allow businesses to be able to operate as smoothly as possible based on the current circumstances. So, how do you engage with the task force? If community leaders have ideas, we encourage you to document those ideas and share via email at ded.info at nebraska.gov. We will need to coordinate and align all of our efforts as we serve Nebraskans and work to keep them safe. Clear communication will be key as we start to roll out these best practices in the various industries. We will continually assess the risk with the end goal of creating the highest level of consumer confidence. We want families to know that they'll be safe and secure when shopping and dining in our state. Please note that the virus is affecting our communities with varying levels of intensity and at different times. We're working to roll out those guidelines so that the regional variations are taken into consideration. Again, we encourage questions and dialogue. DAD is ready and willing to help. You may also contact us by phone at 800-426-6505 with your input. Together, we're going to get Nebraska growing again. Nebraska is one team, and we all wear the same jersey. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Tony. But I think you just took one of my pieces of paper. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. So uh, just to uh, emphasize one of the things that uh, Tony was talking about with regard to the PPP, the Payroll Protection Program, Nebraska was number one with regard to the percentage of payroll being covered at over 80 percent. So that made us the state with the leading number of uh, bankers who had worked with their small businesses to be able to get their payroll covered. That was outstanding, so we want to thank all of our community bankers who worked with our small businesses to be able to make that happen. Now that payroll protection program has been extended. There's more money now for that program, so I encourage all small businesses, if you have not already applied, work with your banker quickly to be able to get that application into the Small Business Administration because that money will not last long as demonstrated by the first time where it did not last long. So please, if you're still one of those small businesses and need one of those loans, work with your banker, get that application in as quickly as possible. Uh, also want to talk about PPE, not to be confused with PPP. PPE is the personal protective equipment that we supply to our healthcare workers and first responders and so forth to be able to help keep them safe. The state has been working to acquire PPE and distributed through our public health departments. To date, we have distributed 1.127 million pairs of gloves, gloves to our, our public health uh, districts. Push those out to be able to help folks uh, protect themselves in our healthcare institutions, for our first responders, and so forth. We have distributed 1.353 million masks. 
we have distributed over 45,000 gowns out to the public health districts and nearly 2,000 gallons of hand sanitizer or sanitizer in general. So we've been working at the state to acquire it. We've been pushing it out to, the, to folks to make sure they've got that constant stream of personal protective equipment in all of our public health districts. So uh, we will continue to do that at the state, acquire that PPE and get it out to folks. But you can see we've been able to get qu quite a bit purchased and pushed out to our public health districts. Uh, there was also a question about expired licenses. Again, when I signed Executive Order 20-5, that extends all expired licenses to past th uh, 30 days past when the emergency ends. So you do not need to get your license uh, renewed because it will be good. And so we'd ask all businesses who take those licenses to remember that if they expired within this period of when we've been impacted by the coronavirus, those licenses are good until 30 days after this emergency ends. So if those licenses are still good. Please still accept them. And see, we've got the schedule for this week. Uh, again, English briefings will be at 2 o'clock Central Time the rest of the week. We'll have our Spanish briefings at 5 p.m. on Tuesday and Thursday. And I will again be on uh, NET at 8.30 p.m. Central Time for the town hall on NET. And now we'll go ahead, and we've got a number of questions today. So again, I'm going to try and move through these at a pretty good pace because uh, I still want to allow folks who are here in the audience to be able to ask questions as well. So. Uh, and we only have about a half an hour in total with this briefing to get that done. So, uh, Christian Wagner, NTV. It came to my attention and others that people from harder hit areas could potentially take part in newly opening facilities in other areas starting May 4th. Like someone from North Platte can go get a haircut in McCook, or someone in Lexington can go to Broken Bow for a massage, or someone from Grand Island can go to York for dinner. Wouldn't there still be a concern that the virus could potentially spread if people from in, in their health districts? and the health districts not having the restaurants and salons open go to one health districts where they are open. And again, folks, this is where we're gonna ask folks if you are in a public health district where those restrictions have not been relaxed, please still stay home. Please do not go to that adjacent health district or wherever it is to go to dinner or get your hair cut or whatever it would be. If you are, for example, in a health district that has still got those restrictions in, like Hall County, please stay home while we're working to slow the spread of virus here in Nebraska. We're trying to do this on a regional basis, but we need your cooperation to be able to help do that. Scott Miller, KNEB. We had a listener ask about camping at state facilities. Is restriction overnight camping still in place or will that be relaxed May 4th? As far as I know, that restriction is still in place. There's no overnight camping in our state campground facilities. Those are managed by Nebraska Game and Parks. And they will be the ones making the determination as to when they will open those back up again. Aaron Grace, the Omaha World Herald. Lancaster County is May 6th still, right? Not May 4th, and yes, that is exactly right. So Douglas County had a different directed health measure than Lancaster County. Douglas County's expired on April 30th. We extended that now to May 3rd. The new DHM for Douglas County will pick up May 4th. Lancaster County is part of um, the DHMs or the directed health measures that expire May 6th, that is still in place and we'll be working with uh, the Lancaster County public health officials and the mayor of Lincoln here to be able to determine on what the new DHM will look like going forward there. And when that, that will take effect. Uh, any other counties or public health districts due to reopen May 4th than the ones listed on Friday? Nope, just the ones we listed Friday are the ones that are currently there for May 4th. Weddings and funerals, are those allowed to go on May 4th, thinking of weddings and funerals outside churches, say in a public park, and the 10 personal limit on public gatherings does not apply to churches or weddings or funerals, is that right? Yes, so that is correct, Aaron. So weddings and funerals can go forward. Again, it will be working with those faith leaders to be able to make sure you're properly socially distancing. You know, for example, households remain together, but six feet away from other households, no sharing among the congregants, social distancing and things, uh, you know, making sure we're doing that and things like communion lines and so forth. So with all those caveats and those guidelines, we expect to roll out this week with regard to those religious services, uh, weddings and funerals. Don Walton, Lincoln Journal Star. Are your decisions to ease current coronavirus sanctions made in collaboration with UNMC? We work with UNMC on a daily basis. We have multiple daily calls set up with the folks at UNMC. And specifically, when we were talking about the, the DHMs that will apply in May, had conversations with uh, Dr. Cradival, Dr. Laurel. We discussed uh, the sanctions and so forth. 
When do you plan to lift the cha or change sanctions in Lincoln? And again, we're going to be working with the uh, folks in the public health department here and the mayor with regard to that. So stay tuned. We'll have more information. Michelle Bandur, KETV. What are your suggestions or would there be direct health measures, regulations for workers who have underlying health conditions and are afraid to go back to work too soon? They fear going back to work and getting sick and or losing their unemployment benefits. One case is a salon worker with COPD. So we certainly encourage people that are maybe older or have those underlying health conditions, do not go back to work. Work with your employer. It's coronavirus related. So you can stay on unemployment and continue to collect that because it's related back to the pandemic we have going on right now. So work with your employer. Again, make sure your employer doesn't call you back to work and then um, and give that information to the state. But if you've applied for unemployment, you're, re you're, gonna, you're receiving those benefits, you can continue to receive those benefits as long as we have this, well, it's the 39 weeks during the emergency or so forth. Just work with your employer, though, to make sure that they don't call you back and then uh, tell the state that. So uh, again, communication is going to be absolutely key here. Please work with your employer, but do not go back to work if you've got one of those underlying health care conditions. Nicole Ebat, KPTM. If a business chooses not to reopen, are their employees still eligible for unemployment insurance? And the answer is just like what we talked about with those folks with underlying health conditions, absolutely. So if a business is not going to remain open because of the uh, current emergency, all those folks are covered by the unemployment. It's coronavirus related. They're still eligible for those benefits. A lot of spas pay their employees on a commission style salary. If a business opens but people aren't coming in for appointments, are those employees eligible for any kind of unemployment. So uh, again, if the people are actually going into work, they're not technically eligible for the unemployment. However, one of the things that the employer could explore, and I'd ask you to reach out uh, maybe to our office, we can connect with John Albin on this directly, who's our commissioner of labor. Uh, the short-term uh, short compensation program, the STC program, is something businesses can apply for, which allow you to be able to keep your people on part-time and then part-time they receive unemployment benefits. STC program, employers have to apply with it, set it up with the state, but if you do that, this might be a way to leverage that so that you don't have to call back the people full-time, you can call them back part-time and they can still receive unemployment benefits. Uh, how much did, uh, say, did county health directors have in relaxing the DHMs? Uh, so again, we consulted with the uh, public health directors in all the counties that we changed the DHM or announced the change for the DHM in, starting in May. So uh, we had conversations with all of them with regard to that. Paul Hamill, Omaha World Herald. Are inmates now being tested for COVID-19? Uh, if so, how many? No, we're not testing inmates for coronavirus. How many new arriving inmates are being handled? And he's got a bunch of different questions here on testing, isolation, transfers, so forth. Paul, we're going to have to just work with you separate on this. You've got a lot of questions here. Uh, we'll just take this offline and work with you directly to get you those answers. Any reconsideration of having the National Guard test everyone in a facility that has a case, uh, as was done in YRTC? And no, we're not considering that either. Uh, Marion Bailey, WWT, can a gymnastics club begin offering classes again on May 4th if they follow social distancing guidelines? So again, we did not close folks down except for those specific instances where we talked about with things like salons, barber shops, um, you know, uh, massage therapy, tattoo parlors, that sort of thing. So gym classes can go on, but you got to maintain the 10-person rule. So no more than 10 people, you got to space out people six feet apart, all those sort of things. Again, those same social distancing guidelines still apply. And again, when we announced that we were loosening some restrictions through May, the reminder is that 10-person rule has not gone away. That is still there. So if you're going to have these classes in May, again, 10 people limit, uh, 10 customers, 6 feet apart, and uh, again, always a good idea to be masked when you're doing that sort of thing too. So uh, please keep those uh, guidelines in mind if you're going to be open for business. Andrew Ozaki, KETV, what is your reaction to the ads that Tyson Food placed in Sunday's paper? How uh, broken are, uh, is our food chain? So I did not see ads in the Omaha World Herald, Martha. OK, so I'm going to go a little off script. Did, would, did they take, Tyson take out one in the Sunday paper? I didn't see it if they did. I, I, think, they, I think they took out some nationally. OK, so Tyson took out some of the ads nationally. So I don't 
read those national papers, so I can't help you with what that ad looked like. But again, one of the things we stress is working with our food processors in the state to keep them open so that we can, don't disrupt our food, si uh, food supply chain. That is just a mission critical thing that we've got to keep going here. And so we're working with folks uh, all across the state. I have weekly, pre uh, weekly phone calls with folks. Um, you know, UNMC has put out their meat processing COVID-19 handbook with best practices. We've toured about seven, or we, Shelly and Dr. James Lawler have toured about seven facilities that are actually, I know Shelly's out again today going to Lexington and going to Hastings to be able to tour more facilities. We're working with the processors to suggest ways that they can make sure that they're doing a good job on social distancing. And the other thing we're going to need to do a better job on, and we started that last week with the Spanish press briefings, is reaching out to communities whose English, English is not the first language. So we know we've got challenges there just because of the language barrier, so we need help from people who do have relationships with those communities to reach out and help those folks get the message with regard to social distancing and why it's important and all that. Uh, we've got to do a better job from the standpoint of reaching out to communities like that. And then we're also engaging with our local public health departments, our, our local, local health clinics, about how we can do a better job of communicating that out and also on contact tracing as we ramp up our contact tracing. Uh, we're also looking at ways we can help with the isolation and quarantine as well. So there's a number of things that we have to, to focus on to be able to address this issue. It's a community issue. It's not just specifically about the processing plants. And we are taking steps to address all those. And we'll continue to look for ways that we can improve upon those. Uh, are our safety measures too late? Well, again, we put measures in starting March 13th with regard to the social distancing. And you can see here in the state of Nebraska, we have flattened the curve. Uh, if you look at other states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Colorado, they had shelter in place orders, yet they still have the same issues that we do with regard to food processors. So what you really have to draw the conclusion of, it's really about the concentration of people both at work and at home that is leading to the issues that when you have trouble dis social distancing, when you have concentrations of people, it's going to be harder to slow the spread of the virus. Why wouldn't slowing down production of these plants be uh, better than a complete shutdown? Uh, again, we're working with the plants to keep them open and running. My understanding is that many of these facilities are running slower uh, as for a number of different reasons. Are some of these bonuses offered by food processors incentivizing employees to work counter to the stay home uh, if you are sick or have had contact with someone who is sick? So my understanding is that the food processors are taking steps to change their incentive systems, for example, making sure that people get paid when they go home sick, um, you know, and so forth. So uh, I believe that those, again, that's part of what we're doing with regard, uh, the overall program to be able to talk to them about best practices. So my understanding is that those uh, incentive systems are being changed. Uh, Rob McCartney, KETV. It took two cases of community spread to shut us down the first time. That's still happening. What's the criteria for shutting us down again? How would you work with unemployment for our employees? So again, as we think about the measures that we put in place, we put this in place to be able to slow the spread of the virus, and we have been successful. And the reason we're slowing the spread of the virus is so that we don't overwhelm the healthcare system. That is the ultimate goal, and that has been successful as well. If you look across the state, we've got between 40 and 50 percent capacity on hospital beds, ICU beds, and 75 percent capacity on ventilators. So we know that we have not, you know, overwhelmed the healthcare system here in the state of Nebraska. And the two cases of community spread that Rob is talking about was really just kind of a rule of thumb so that we could take a look at when will we need to put these restrictions in place and being very conservative in doing that. Now as we see ramped up testing and so forth and the fact that we've got more PPE and we're going to do more contact tracing, all these things are leading, going to lead us to a more targeted way to be able to do the quarantine and isolation to slow the spread of the virus. So what we did at first was based upon the fact that we didn't have a lot of testing and we still didn't know a lot about the virus and we didn't have a lot of PPE and we were being conservative. And so we want to uh, continue to think about using the data that we're getting from the testing to be able to loosen those restrictions. But again, at the end of the day, it's all about preserving the hospital system. And if you want to think about this, um, as an analogy, we could end just about all of our, the deaths on the interstate by reducing the speed limit to five miles an hour, but we don't do that. What we're doing here 
is we have put the things in place to reduce the speed limit to five miles an hour with regard to the coronavirus. But what we're trying to do is actually find what's the right speed. What is the right speed for us to be able to manage our healthcare system, to make sure it does not become overwhelmed? That's what we're looking for right now, is to make sure we've put these things in place, we've slowed everybody down, now we're trying to find what is the right speed to be at so that we do not overwhelm the healthcare system. And that's what we're gonna be focused on as we go forward here into the summer. But I wanna remind everybody, we're gonna be social distancing throughout the course of the summer and into the fall. There'll be some sort of measures we take as we go forward here. We're just trying to find that right speed. Okay, so I have managed to do that. We still have a couple of minutes left for the, the questions here in the room, so we'll go ahead and open up to Q&A here. Martha. So, as you just said that your guiding principle is to make sure that the hospitals in the state are not overwhelmed, so what went into your calculations of deciding that you could loosen these restrictions? Did you look at um, how many more cases the hospitals could handle Yeah, so what the question was, what did we look at with regard to the hospital? So we, again, we just really focused on those kind of three broad things with regard to hospital bed availability, ICU bed availability, and ventilators. And looking at the state and saying we got 75% of our ventilators are open in the state of Nebraska. You look at the experience we had, for example, with Hall and Grand Island and the folks at CHI St. Francis did a, have done a fantastic job. They've worked very hard. We've moved patients to be able to make sure we had the space to accommodate them there. Same thing we've been doing in Lexington as well. So we've been able to manage this on a local uh, area basis when we have had you know, those hot spots that we've seen around the state. So we've looked at that. We looked at some of the rates of, uh, you know, where in, you know, when we look at the Omaha area, we're looking at rates of the infection and so forth. So there are a variety of things that we look at. You know, for example, if you look at what happened in Lexington, we saw the percent testing positive go up to 30, 40%, right, over, over 40%. That was an indicator that we knew that there may be something going on with regard to the Lexington hospital system. And so we moved to be able to make space available there and to make sure we could accommodate everybody. So that's how we're gonna to continue to manage this going forward. And that's how we kind of looked at this when we said, okay, we're gonna start loosening things up. We took in feedback from public health directors with regard to the guidelines. We looked at a variety of different things to be able to make that decision that we're gonna take some of these, these small steps to be able to start opening things up and loosening some of the restrictions. Fred. Why not test inmates at least at the facilities where the two um, teammates who tested positive were? And if you don't test inmates, how do you know that there are no cases? So the question was, uh, if you're not going to do broad-based testing of inmates, well, why not do it? Or how do you know they don't have it? Again, we're treating inmates the same way we're treating everybody else. If you're symptomatic and there's reason to believe that you are high risk for getting coronavirus, then we would test those inmates. But so they're not being not tested. The point is they're being treated just like everybody else in the community. If you're at those high risk categories, then we'll go test them. If you're not, then we're not going to test them. And so we'll take the same approach as we look at corrections. Uh, we'll take the same approach as far as corrections, um, you know, with regard to, you know, who did that uh, teammate have contact with? We'll do the same sort of contact tracing we do that we do in Grand Island or Omaha or wherever where we have those cases test positive. Any more questions? Okay. Uh, again, we'll have to give, I do not know the answer to the question of whether an inmate's been tested. Yeah, John. Um, with regards to some of the salons reopening, um, we've heard from some people that are wondering how some customers are going to keep on a mask, whether they're getting their hair washed uh, or some type of facial. Is there some way that customers can take off a mask? Is that the necessary thing to do? So the question was, what about if you're going to a salon and wearing a mask, can you take it off? And the answer is no that you're gonna just have to work around that mask. So facials are probably not gonna be something you're gonna be doing anytime in the near future. You're probably gonna to have to keep it to, you know, hairstyling or something like that. Lee, last question. I was gonna ask Tony a question in regards to that task force. Tony, can you come up here for the task force, please? Absolutely. Do you mind just explaining how it looks uh, when you guys get it going, what, what companies or restaurants or whoever you're working with can expect from your assistance and then what assistance and helpful you'll, you'll be providing? Well, I think what they can expect is a calculated, really directed um, operation from an execution standpoint and first and foremost taking their input and then using that input to operationalize the plan 
and then looking at it in probably 14 day increments to make sure that the plan is going as we expected it to go. And we'll continue to take feedback from our advisors, which are the chambers and the local business community and make adjustments accordingly. Great, thank you very much, Tony. And again, thank you all very much for joining us on this different time that we had for the briefing. We'll be back here tomorrow at the regular time, 2 p.m. Central Time, to have another briefing with regard to the state's response to slowing the spread of the virus here in Nebraska. Thank you very much, and we'll see you tomorrow afternoon. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate it.